What's up, y'all? It's Dr. Paul with another Silver Age Grail call for Liberty Hill Comics, where I share my passion and over 40 years' experience comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. Today, we're opening another very special comic book, an early Silver Age mega key, and that's why I called it a Grail call. This one has got to be considered a blue chip investment grade book, period. Compared with other Silver Age Mega Keys, it's much more difficult to find, especially in high grade. I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. While I open this box up, I want to thank you for joining me today. And if you enjoy this video, please take a few seconds to give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, Hit that bell icon for notifications of my new videos. Are you seeing this? I am in absolute awe that I own this book in this grade. This is a really special book to me. It's a book that I just love and I'm just so grateful to own a copy this nice of it. As I like to say, what is it and why do we care? This is Brave and the Bold, number 28, from March 1960. Written by Gardner Fox and illustrated by Mike Sikowski, with inks by Murphy Anderson. It's the first appearance of the Justice League of America, the brainchild of editor Julius Schwartz, the father of the Silver Age. It's graded by CGC as Universal 6.0 with cream to off-white pages. This book is one of the most significant keys in the Silver Age, and I'm thrilled to add this very nice copy to my personal collection. To put this book in perspective, you have to understand the end of the Golden Age and what led to the revival of superhero comic books that became known as the Silver Age. In the period immediately following World War II, superhero comics did not sell well. Nearly all of the superhero comics were removed from the newsstand by the end of the decade of the 40s, simply for failing to make their publishers any money. By 1950, the only superhero comic solo titles being published were what we call today DC's Big Three, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. DC had anthology titles like Adventure Comics and More Fun Comics that featured a few superhero stories. So in addition to the big three, Aquaman and Green Arrow were still being published regularly, but did not have their own titles. Timely Comics, the company we call Marvel Comics today, was not publishing a single superhero title. War, horror, sci-fi, and funny books all survived to one degree or another although the publication of The Seduction of the Innocent and the resulting fervor essentially wiped out horror comics by 1954. After a hiatus of nearly a decade, superhero comic books began returning to the marketplace, which sparked what we now refer to as the Silver Age of Comics. Most collectors recognized the relaunch of The Flash with a new identity and a new sci-fi origin in October 1956 by Julius Schwartz, Robert Kaniger, and Carmine Infantino to be the first comic book of the Silver Age. But the Silver Age did not spring forth fully formed like Athena from Zeus's head. In fact, showcase issues 5, 6, and 7 didn't even feature the Flash, as DC waited for sales figures back from issue 4 to see if they could even market any superheroes other than the big three in the mid-50s. But superheroes did come back, slowly at first. Next up was a new look Green Lantern in October of 1959 in Showcase Comics number 22, and then in an avalanche of relaunched and new heroes culminating for DC in the relaunch of the Justice Society of America, renamed by Julius Schwartz the Justice League of America in this book. Brave and the Bold number 28, from March of 1960. Emboldened by DC's success, Marvel joined the fray with the publication of Fantastic Four number 1 
in November of 1961 from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy No. 15 in August of 1962 from Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, and the rest is Silver Age history. In fact, the story goes that Martin Goodman, Stan Lee's wife's cousin and publisher of Atlas Comics, before it was called Marvel Comics, was golfing with an executive from National Comics. That is what DC Comics was called in those days. And the DC executive told him that he had just seen the sales figures for Justice League, and it was a huge success. As the story goes, Martin raced back to the office to tell Stan to start pumping out superhero books because they were all the rage again. At the time, Atlas Comics wasn't publishing a single superhero book. This sent Stan soul-searching, because according to his bio, he didn't want to continue putting out the same drivel, and in fact was prepared to quit the comic book biz just when Martin Goodman ordered him to fire up the superhero stories. According to Stan, it was his wife Joan who suggested, rather than quit, that he give it one more go, but that he write the comics his way, the way he'd always wanted to do it, suggesting that the worst that could happen is it would be a huge failure and he'd be fired, but then he was going to quit anyway, so he may as well take a chance. He did Fantastic Four number one with Jack Kirby his way, with more realistic heroes with feet of clay, and followed up with Tales to Astonish 27, Incredible Hulk 1, Amazing Fantasy 15, Journey into Mystery 83, Tales of Suspense 39, and ultimately, Marvel's own Justice League, who the Wasp named the Avengers in Avengers number 1. So, without Brave and the Bold 28 here, we don't have the Marvel Age, we don't get the MCU. This book is ground floor for the development of the Silver Age and ultimately Marvel's, and now Disney's, success in the box office. Brave and the Bold 28 has been recognized as one of the most important Silver Age comics for decades. It's routinely one of the top 5 to 10 books of the Silver Age by fair market value, in part because it's approximately two times more rare than Fantastic Four number one, and three times more rare than Amazing Fantasy 15. Brave and the Bold 28 follows the old formula for Justice Society of America. In fact, the only reason Julius didn't call it the Justice Society is that he felt society was an old-fashioned name for old people, and that young people of 1960 wanted something that implied more action. He thought sports heroes all played in leagues, and Justice League sounded more action-oriented and exciting to the youth of 1960. The story opens with a splash page roll call in the style of the old Justice Society stories in All-Star Comics. The role includes Aquaman, Wonder Woman, Superman, Green Lantern, Batman, Flash, and John Jones. We learn later that Flash is the chairman, this is not an origin story for the Justice League. We start the story with the Justice League fully functional and presumed to have been in operation for some time as they have a defined membership, communication, headquarters, chairman, protocols, etc. The story proper opens with Peter the Pufferfish alerting Aquaman of a menace from the stars, a giant starfish that fell to the ocean and recruited three terrestrial starfish, imbued them with its power, and sent them off with nefarious tasks that Peter overheard and relayed to Aquaman. Aquaman uses the communication device in his belt to summon the Justice League. We get establishing shots of each of the members, giving us a little of what they were doing in their non-JLA time, and learn that Superman and Batman are unavailable because they're each involved in time-sensitive emergencies of their own. The five available members of the JLA meet at headquarters, and, as chairman, Flash hands out the assignments in the fashion of an old issue of All-Star. Green Lantern tackles one starfish solo, 
Wonder Woman and John Jones go after another, Flash assigns one to himself, and asks Aquaman to patrol the oceans and ensure that Starro recruits no additional starfish. As you can see from this half-splash page to Chapter 2, Mike Sikowski's art is phenomenal in this issue of Brave and the Bold. I'm not always a fan of his art. I think sometimes it's a little stiff. But he really has taken pride in dynamic layouts here and tremendous detail and was clearly given ample time to complete this entire story as nothing looks rushed. He's inked by a team of skilled craftsmen varying by chapter. And even so, Murphy Anderson's inks on the Flash chapter stand out to my eye as phenomenal. All the inkers contribute to a very polished and cohesive look. The colorist is uncredited and still unknown to this day, but did a phenomenal job of creating a bright, vibrant look that complements the line art. In his chapter, Green Lantern saves a U.S. Air Force bomber from Starro's minion and uses his ring to restore the starfish to normal power and size, but not until after it had pulled an atomic bomb from the aircraft, exploded it, and consumed all the energy from the blast. Wonder Woman and John Jones similarly have to save a haul of scientists from their starfish and succeed in doing so and in subduing their starfish, but again, not until after it had probed the minds of the scientists for information and relayed that information back to Starro. The Flash's chapter introduces Snapper Carr, the hip young kid who is immune to the starfish's mind control powers. Flash similarly must save the townspeople of Happy Harbor and defeats his starfish, but not before it conveyed to Starro that he can control human minds. Flash takes Snapper with him to the final showdown with Starro, believing that Snapper's immunity to the mind control may be the solution to defeating Starro. While the team battles Starro, Flash instructs Green Lantern to analyze Snapper for possible reasons he was immune to Starro's mind control. He had just finished fertilizing his family's lawn and had lime residue on his body. Deducting that this is what gave him immunity and that it may be Starro's weakness, the team collects some bags of lime and coats Starro in them, thus defeating Starro. Snapper is awarded an honorary membership and given a JLA belt to summon the team should he ever need them. There are a mere 1,279 universal copies of Brave and the Bold number 28 in the CGC census, with a median grade of only 4.0. That's not a lot of copies in the market for such an important book. A 6.0 represents the top 17% of copies in the census and has a fair market value of $6,000 with a 12-month range of $5,300 to $7,700 and an all-time record high of $9,880. One of the reasons I like these mega key books for long-term investment is that they just haven't been hit that hard by the bear market in comic books of the last two years. Real blue chip collectible assets, this sought after, will generally always have buyers stepping in when the market falters, and that is the case with Brave and the Bold number 28. This book is only down 35% from record highs, while many collectibles are down 50 to 75 percent, or even more, from their pandemic highs. I recently won this copy in an eBay auction. I was high bidder after 24 total bids at $5,655 plus shipping and taxes. This is very close to the lowest a 6.0 copy has traded hands for in the trailing 12 months. Long-term viewers of the channel know this is a collectible asset that I consider investment grade and that I already own a few lower grade copies of this key comic book. I've been waiting for a good deal on a mid-grade copy for a long time, so I was thrilled to pick this copy up. 
I'm comfortable getting this comic book at a few hundred dollars below the current fair market value and holding for the long term. I do understand it's an embarrassment of riches to be able to put this sort of capital into funny books, and I feel very fortunate indeed to be able to be the current caretaker of this treasure. I hope you enjoyed this video on this early Silver Age mega key. Anyone else out there own Brave and the Bold number 28, or are you hunting for it? Any JLA fans out there? Do you think this is a reasonable investment to have in your portfolio at this point in time? Or a dumb idea because you think the economy is tanking and this comic book is going much lower? They've been calling for a full recession for two years now and it's still not here, so it's difficult to say. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, happy hunting and take care of one another.